very happy and very honored to be here with Della and everybody else. Uh, I met Della in the autumn of 1990 uh, in the northwest Romanian city of Cluj, Cluj Napoca, in the heart of Transylvania. And um, um, one of their last old friends from Luxembourg had come to Cluj to continue her studies in uh, linguistics, and Della decided to come and visit. And uh, I was only a baby Baha'i at the time. I had only been a Baha'i a few weeks or a couple of months at the time when Della came. And I was really in awe of all these wonderful people mature in the faith and uh, over the years, um, Della definitely remained one of the most important figures um, in my formative period um, as a Baha'i. So I'm, I'm, it's an honor and a privilege to have known her and to be friends with her all this time. Um, during her visit in Cluj, um, at that time, there wasn't very much to do. And uh, Della had a lot of time to spare. And uh, she was going through her friend's library and she started to read this book uh, about the guardian of the Baha'i Fed, Shoghi Effendi, written by his wife, Ruhia Hanum, who was still alive at that time. And uh, mention is made in that book about, this was a very important episode about Queen Marie's acceptance of the Baha'i faith and her, her letters of appreciation of the Baha'i faith. And uh, this story piques Della's interest. And after she returned, at the time she was serving um, at the Baha'i World Center in Israel. So this was only a short holiday from her time of service there when she came to Cluj in 1990. So when she returned to Haifa, then after her visit, um, she pursued everything she could read, everything she could find about Kirmuri. Really remember, there was no internet at the time, I think. And <laughs> um, so she was looking for books and for any other materials that she could find to read and um, even wrote to the um, state archives in uh, Bucharest um, to find out if it's possible to obtain some to consult documents and obtain more information. And actually this request was granted. So in the summer of 91, um, Della, who had studied French and international studies uh, in college, this, um, she was planning to go back for graduate studies in um, translations and interpreting. But before going back uh, in the autumn for uh, to continue starting this postgraduate studies, um, she decided to go and spend the summer in Romania and go to the state archives and see if she can obtain more information about Queen Marie. Um, in May 91, um, Rukia Hanum, Shoghi Effendi's wife, uh, April and May, she actually came to Romania for a visit. And um, I've met her myself uh, a couple of times on that occasion. And um, so when she returned, um, that was the occasion that the first National Spiritual Assembly of Romania, which is the national um, administrative body that uh, the presides over the activities of the friends, the affairs of the uh, Baha'is in, in a country, it was elected for the first time and Rukhia Hanum had come to be present at that occasion. And um, so when she returned to Haifa, where she was residing after her visit in Romania, she was telling everybody, you know, her experiences, how thirsty people were for spiritual things and um, how, um, you know, it's a receptive moment in the history there after the fall of communism. And um, she was encouraging everybody to go and uh, spend time there to help develop the community and consolidate it. So Della was very comfortable that she had already decided to, um, to go and spend her summer in Romania. But there was a small twist to this story because just before she was leaving, she received an invitation for lunch to Rukia Hanum's house, who actually asked Della to spend a whole year, not just the summer, like to put off her, her studies for a year and go and spend the whole year in Romania on her behalf, on Rukia Hanum's behalf, um, to serve, um, to help develop and serve the Baha'i community, the newly formed community there. So Della decided that, uh, you know, this is um, obviously a, a great honor and a, a very great confirmation of her own plans to spend time there. Uh, but as it happened, that one year turned into 25 years that Della spent uh, in Romania. So uh, this was the time now to go and um, it was, there was the culture shock of going to live in a country that was on a different planet in most ways. Uh, then there was learning the language. 
I think Della had a small advantage there because of her being fluent, uh, proficient in French, but being a Romance language, anybody who had uh, any knowledge of a Romance language um, had, it was a bit easier to uh, to learn Romanian. Uh, so Della said that she was about, took about six months for her to become fluent in Romanian. So um, during this time, she was one of the great pillars of strength uh, in, in lots of activities in the community. There was lots going on. So she was very busy with all these things. Um, so as soon as she be was more comfortable with the language, she started to uh, go to the archives, to state archives uh, on a very regular basis to pursue her research um, on Queen Marine's documents. And uh, there are some funny stories there because there was, uh, you know, the government may have changed, but habits and attitudes and ways of doing things from the communist time took a lot longer to change. So everything was still done the old way. Um, for example, um, the only things that she was allowed to bring in the building was uh, pen and paper. Um, I had to sign in and out. Um, had to fill out two different forms in triplicate without carbon paper. And there was always some fault in whatever was written down. So they had to be filled out multiple times, uh, all of those six pages, you know, to, to do them um, a few times every time she wanted to go. But anyway, eventually she got access to the documents, you know, big, thick binders full of documents. Uh, so then I had to design a plan how to pursue this research because otherwise it was going to take very long. So decided to restrict the research to the period that was most relevant to the story that she was investigating. Um, then there was also the conditions because these old buildings with um, air conditioning, it was very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. There was this microfiche reading machines that um, had bulbs that could not be replaced at that stage. So every 20 minutes they had to be turned off um, so that they would not overheat because then if the machine breaks, then big problems. So, and everything that she found, any piece of information that was found in, the, in those binders had to be copied by hand as there were no copying facilities or picture taken facility or anything like that. So. I think you get an idea of the kind of effort and it was a labor of love and devotion to carry out the research uh, for this book. But all of this was actually um, very much paid off when suddenly uh, Della came across handwriting that she knew and lo and behold, that was the original letter um, sent by Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the faith to Queen Marie uh, after the first, um, first public acknowledgement of the Baha'i faith that Queen Mary made, I'm sure that I'm going to mention that, in the Toronto Daily Star on 4th of May, 1926. So Shoghi Effendi wrote a letter to her on that, okay, after that um, she, he got the article. And um, there is no copy of this letter in the Baha'i archives at the World Center. There is only a draft of the letter and we didn't really know what was written in it. So the fact that Della could sent to the House of Justice um, an original that, that an original letter, the copy of the original letter sent by Jean Effendi, that was an enormous find, you know, really, really precious. So um, things like that definitely made, made up for all the hardship involved. I don't know how many minutes I spoke, but I'm almost finished now. So anyway, through all of this, uh, it became clear that there's a big story to be told there and that I applied herself to writing that, to telling that story. And of course, in situations like this, you really feel that you're being held by the object of your, <laughs> of your research and of your love. And um, she talks about how she felt inspired and uh, guided and protected by Queen Marie and by Martha Root, who taught her the faith. And um, in 2000, in the year 2000, the book, Her Eternal Crown, Queen Marie of Romania and the Baha'i Faith was published by George Ronald. So I wanted to tell these stories in the introduction so Della wouldn't have to spend any time on, on this aspect of the, of the project that she can just focus on the Queen Marie herself and her story. So. Look forward to hearing it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Lydia, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's lovely to be with such a large group of people all around the world, um, and especially to share the story of this most beloved queen whose um, station, spiritual station, none of us really understand. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation that's shared by even by very well-meaning people. So this is one of the reasons that I undertook to um, uh, research Queen Marie's relationship with the Baha'i faith, which um, extended from 1926 to her passing in 1938. And it's a very, very uh, interesting story. And I feel very honored to have been the person to um, do this research and um, publish the first book. I'm presently working on the English version of a second book that I published um, in 2019 in Romanian, uh, which will be called Queen Marie, an Instrument in Greater Hands. So, <clears throat> It's always a bit challenging talking about this uh, subject uh, to people, some people who have read the book because um, you don't want it to be boring. And so what I like to do is I um, have prepared a PowerPoint presentation which gives uh, an overview of Queen Marie's life in pictures mostly and in uh, statements and documents so that it makes it more appealing to, to a broader audience, people who have read about her um, association with the Baha'i faith and those who have not. And then there are also many people who don't know very much about Queen Marie. So I will share my screen. So as I said, um, the first book that I wrote is called Her Eternal Crown, Queen Marie of Romania and the Baha'i Faith. And I believe that it's a pretty uh, extensive uh, picture of this relationship that Queen Marie of Romania had with the Baha'i Faith. For those of you, as was mentioned in the introduction, who don't know anything about the Baha'i Faith, you can stay on afterwards. There are many beautiful introductory books that um, can be obtained uh, online. And um, there's also the uh, Baha'i.org, which is the official um, website of the Baha'i International Community, which uh, links to a very extensive uh, library of books that are online. So I would like to begin by um, introducing Marie as the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, who has uh, an interesting story related to the Baha'i faith. And I'll just mention that these, um, these paintings uh, that you'll see throughout, it's, it's just one, actually one painting that you'll see throughout this presentation are um, paintings done by Queen Marie herself. So, um, Queen Marie was um, the daughter of Alfred, who was the second son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Um, Alfred married Grand Duchess Marie of Russia, who was the only daughter of Tsar Alexander II. So she's from two very powerful families. And she was born in 1875. This is Queen Victoria, 
who was known as Her Majesty Victoria by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, Queen Defender of the Faith, Empress of India. She married Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha on the 10th of February, 1840. And they had nine children. Here's a beautiful photograph of the couple with their children. This is Prince Alfred, who was the Duke of Edinburgh as a young man. And I mentioned that there was a connection between um, uh, Queen Victoria and the Baha'i Faith because Baha'u'llah, prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith, wrote to the kings and rulers at his, during his lifetime. And one of them, of course, was Queen Victoria. And in his letter to her, he says the following, O Queen in London, we make mention of thee for the sake of God and desire that thy name may be exalted through thy remembrance of God, the creator of earth and heaven. He verily is witness unto that which I say. We have been informed that thou hast forbidden the trading in slaves, both men and women. This verily is what God hath enjoined in this wondrous revelation. God hath truly destined a reward for thee because of this. He verily will pay the doer of good his due recompense, wert thou to follow what hath been sent unto thee by him who is the all-knowing, the all-informed. All of these tablets to the kings and rulers are contained in a beautiful book called The Summons of the Lord of Hosts, which can be found online, as I mentioned earlier. Marie was also the granddaughter of Tsar Alexander II of Russia, who was married to Marie also. This is a photograph of Tsar Alexander II, his imperial majesty, the emperor and autocrat of all the Russias. He had just one daughter. And here is young Princess Maria Alexandrovna with her father. Shortly before she married. This is a photograph of Princess Maria Alexandrovna on her wedding day. 23rd of January, 1874, and they were married at the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Here she is with her father and her brother on the left and her husband on the right, Duke Alfred of Edinburgh. So they are the parents of Queen Marie. Baha'u'llah also wrote to the Tsar of Russia, a letter contained in the same volume, the summons of the Lord of Hosts, in which he says, O Tsar of Russia, whilst I lay chained and fettered in the prison, one of thy ministers extended me his aid Wherefore hath God ordained for thee a station which the knowledge of none can comprehend except his knowledge? Beware lest thou barter away this sublime station. Thy Lord verily doeth what he willeth. What he pleaseth will God abrogate or confirm. And with him is the knowledge of all things in a guarded tablet. For those of you who might not be Baha'is, some of these things may be a little bit strange or complicated, but um, as you read more from the Baha'i writings, from the writings of Baha'u'llah, um, you will probably come to appreciate, like many of us, the beauty of these writings. 
So out of the union of these two great houses um, was born Marie, daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh. Romania at the time um, looked like this. It was um, half the size that it is now. Um, the white outline is Romania in 1893 when Marie arrived. And you'll see that it is surrounded by the Black Sea, Bulgaria, Serbia, what was then Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Ukraine, and Bessarabia. Prince Karl of Hohenzollern Sigmaringen was invited to come to Romania in 1866 to be installed on the Romanian throne. He romanized his name to Carol and declared his, himself king in May 1881. He was married to Princess Elizabeth of Wied, a German princess, in 1869. They had one child, Maria, born in 1871, who died when she was three years old, leaving the princedom without an heir. And what is interesting about Princess Elizabeth of Vied was that she was one of the princesses that was being considered when Queen Victoria was looking for a wife for Prince Alfred, who became Queen Marie's father. This is Ferdinand. Um, son of Leopold and brother of Prince Karl of Romania, who renounced his right to the Romanian throne in favor of his sons. His eldest son, William, did not want to become Prince of Romania, so this responsibility fell in 1886 to Prince Ferdinand, nephew of German-born Romanian King Carol, and he would wait until 1886 to ascend the throne. And in this time, he had to find a wife and carry on the line of succession. Marie was born at Eastwell Park on the 29th of October, 1875. She was baptized Marie Alexandra Victoria. This is the baptism announcement, which appeared in the Times of London. I wasn't able to find her birth announcement, but hopefully someday I'll, I'll manage to do that. Here is Marie with her parents. And Marie was known to those close to her also as Missy. And she became Princess of Edinburgh. This is her as a young child, an avid reader all of her life. Here she is with her, the first of her three siblings, Alfred, Victoria Melita on the left and Alexandra in the front. And here she is with her father and brother. These are the Edinburgh children at play with their cousins. And here is a portrait done of the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh with their eldest children. And this is a picture of Missy holding, um, uh, holding a picture of her paternal grandmother, Queen Victoria. A photograph taken in 1837, which she 
indicated by writing the date on her dress, on her collar. And here she is at that same time with her two sisters, older sisters. And here are the first five children. And the two princesses performed in a play that they wrote themselves called The Vision. Queen Marie is on the left. This is a photograph of Marie and some of her relatives in Malta, where her father was posted with the British Royal Navy between 1888 and 1889. And it was here that she spent much time with her cousin, Prince George of Wales, who became the future King George V. This was a very happy time for Marie. She really loved Malta very much. And this picture shows her parents and she is sitting to her father's left and her cousin, George, is on the far right in this photograph. Here she is with cousin George, later King George V. There was a romantic interest on both sides, especially from George, uh, but Marie's mother, even though she was married to a British prince, uh, did not like the Brits, Brits very much, so she did everything she could to prevent this marriage. What is interesting to me is that um, Hannah Pakula, who is a biographer of Queen Marie, uh, wrote that she believed that if Marie had become queen of uh, Great Britain, she would have had to follow in many, many footsteps of earlier queens, uh, queen consorts. Whereas because she became only the second queen of Romania, she was really able to develop that position in a way that was quite uh, unique and um, wonderful. So Marie became the wife of Crown Prince Ferdinand of Romania, who was later King Ferdinand. And she was also the mother of Carol, Elisabetha, Marie, Nicholas, Ileana, and Mircea. This was Prince Ferdinand Victor Albert Meinrad of Hohenzollern Sigmaringen, who was born on 20 July. 1865. It's a photograph of him as a young boy. And this is Princess Marie at about the time that she got married. Here's the couple. This is their official engagement photograph in 1982. And this was the announcement that was made of their wedding at Sigmaringen in Germany on January 10th, 1893. Here's the beautiful bride. And a drawing done of their wedding. Here's the young couple, and I particularly like the photograph on the right because they're skating. So um, one sees that they engage in all sorts of different activities. And here is the family gathered with Tsar 
Nicholas of Russia, who was Marie's cousin. He and his family, of course, were assassinated during the Russian Revolution. And in this photograph, although it's not that apparent, but I have another photograph where it shows just Marie, you can see that she is pregnant. She's on the far left. And here they are, uh, Marie and Ferdinand with their firstborn, Prince Carol, who was born on the 15th of October, 1893. Here's Marie with her two eldest children, Carol and Elisabetta. And the family continued to grow, adding Marie and Nicholas. In the right hand photograph, the, the family is standing with King Carol and his wife, Elizabetha, Elizabeth. And the last two children, Ileana and Mircha. Unfortunately, Mircha, the little boy with the very cheeky look, died in 1916 at the age of three of typhoid fever. It was just after the First World War had broken out and um, the royal family had to leave Bucharest and move up north to try to avoid being killed. And they had just buried this young child and it really broke their heart. Here's another photograph of one of Princess Marie's, Queen Marie's favorite activities, horse riding. She was a very accomplished rider. And here's, here are two photographs of the royal couple later in life. Marie loved the Romanian clothing and she was often photographed wearing traditional Romanian clothing, which is, some of it is very beautiful. And this is a later photograph of King Carol I and Queen Elizabeth. Carol died at the end of 1914. The coronation of King Ferdinand I and Queen Marie of Romania took place on the 15th of October, 1922 in the city of Oradia. It uh, took them that long to be coronated because of the war. Another photograph of king and queen. And here is King Ferdinand with his first grandson, Prince Michael, who later became King Michael, King Mihai, who died not too long ago. Um, Here's a painting done by Philip de Laszlo of Queen Marie. Again, in the Romanian traditional costume, there are very, very many photographs of Queen Marie. This is one of my favorites. Um, I imagine her perhaps writing to Shoghi Effendi or um, Martha Root, who were of course two people who have very important roles in her life and in the history of the Baha'i faith. 
This photograph was taken at the castle in Bran, which is in central Romania. And um, this castle was returned to Queen Marie's grandchildren not too long ago in the probably the late 90s, early 2000s. And the queen engaged in many activities in Romania. She was very concerned that the Romanian people have a good life. Here she is with a group of um, orphans. Here she's talking to some gypsies. Here in a town received by the older generation. And during the war, she was very, very well known for um, doing her part in helping out the war wounded. She did not have medical training, but she would go, she would read them stories, she would bring them gifts and was really much beloved by the Romanian people. Always encouraging people, always trying to make them feel as happy as possible under the circumstances. Um, a little known fact, unfortunately, is that Queen Marie was asked by uh, her husband to go to Paris, to the Paris Peace Conference after the First World War to plead uh, informally on um, Romania's behalf. And it is because of her lobbying efforts that, um, that, that were actually very, very successful. She, she managed to, to talk to all of these men who were against Romania and not that keen on women being involved in any of these activities. She was able to, um, gain a lot of territory for Romania. So Romania actually doubled in size. Here she is again with her husband. And this is a photograph of them with King George V and Queen Mary. And this is um, an interesting photograph. It's uh, Queen Marie's driver's license. And uh, one of Lija and my friends, Vara Enayati, who has been a Baha'i pioneer in Romania for many, many years, was able to purchase this at a, an auction house. She was an avid and very good driver. So um, Queen Marie was known um, as the mother of the Balkans because uh, the mother-in-law of the Balkans because um, her some of her children married uh, royalty from the different Balkan countries. So here she is with King Alexander on the left. He was the king of Yugoslavia, who um, unfortunately was assassinated in Marseille. Her daughter Marie married Alexander. And on the right are uh, the Duke and Duchess of York, later King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. They are the parents of the current Queen Elizabeth.
Here is the last photograph taken of King Ferdinand and his coffin being moved from the central Romanian town of Sinaia to its resting place in Curta de Argeș, where all of the kings and queens of Romania are buried. Here's Queen Marie with her daughter Marie on the balcony in Sinaia as the coffin is being removed. And the royal family joining the procession. And now we come to Queen Marie's encounter with the Baha'i Faith. To give you a little bit of background, the woman who told Queen Marie about the Baha'i Faith was known as Martha Root, who received a letter on the 10th of January, 1919 from Abdul Baha, who was the son of the prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith, Baha'u'llah. In this letter, Abdul Baha tells Martha Root, my hope from the blessings of his holiness Baha'u'llah is that thou mayest forget rest and composure and like unto a swift flying bird, thou mayest reproduce the melody of the kingdom and engage in songs and music in the best of tunes. All ears are alert for the summons to the most great peace. It is therefore better for thee to travel now around the world, if this is conveniently possible, and roar out the call of the divine kingdom. Thou shalt witness great results and extraordinary confirmations. Martha Root took this very much to heart. She set out not long afterwards on her world travels. It said that the only country she not visit was Russia because she never received a visa. This was her passport photograph. And to give you an idea of some of the places that she visited, Australia, Iraq, Germany, for those of you who are Baha'is, you will recognize Hand of the Cause, Grossmann and his wife in Germany. Uh, Tabriz, Iran. So in those days, women and men were kept separate. So this was a women's gathering. And this was a men's gathering with Martha Root in Tehran. And a friend of Martha's talks about her travels and says, and so on and on she traveled, not young or strong, not beautiful, not rich, alone, and more than once in terrible danger, on and on for 20 years. She had begun these journeys in response to Abdul Baha's mandate to America, issued in his tablets of the divine plan. That was 1919. She was the first to arise and she carried on with her work until far from home, she stumbled and fell in her tracks. Here she is in Japan. Hand of the cause, Agnes Alexander is standing behind Martha Root. Here in Egypt, some of you may recognize Mr. Aziz Yazdi on the left, seated on the left. 
and a photograph of Martha in India and here in Bulgaria. and in the Holy Land. In the Kitabi Akdas, which is the most great book of the Baha'i Faith, Baha'u'llah says, how great the blessedness that awaiteth the king who will arise to aid my cause in my kingdom, who will detach himself from all else but me. Such a king is numbered with the companions of the crimson ark, the ark which God hath prepared for the people of Baha. All must glorify his name, must reverence his station, and aid him to unlock the cities with the keys of my name, the omnipotent protector of all that inhabit the visible and invisible kingdoms. Such a king is the very eye of mankind, the luminous ornament on the brow of creation, the fountainhead of blessings unto the whole world. Offer up, O people of Baha, your substance, nay, your very lives, for his assistance. The Baha'i faith had a guardian who was head of the, that, the faith after his grandfather, Abdul Baha, passed away. He was married to Ruhia Rabbani, and uh, Lija spoke about her. She wrote in the book that um, I read during those during my first visit, from the inception of Shoghi Effendi's ministry, she not only turned her loving heart to him, and he's talking here about Martha Root, but constantly sought his advice as to her plans. It would not be exaggerating to say they had a partnership in all her undertakings, marked by a mutual love and confidence, all too rare in the harassed life of the guardian. They kept in close touch a flow of letters and cables apprising him of her plans, her needs, her victories, her requests for guidance, and his unfailing answers giving encouragement and advice. She turned to him at all times, unhesitatingly making requests of him, which she felt were in the interests of the faith. The guardian was well aware of both the purity of her motives and her good judgment, and almost invariably acceded to these requests, which ranged from letters of encouragement to individuals, to cabled messages, to figures of great prominence. Love begets love. Martha's great love for Shoghi Effendi called forth his love and his responses the way the capacity of a diamond to reflect light captures its rays and casts them back brilliantly. She went on to say Martha Root was firmly convinced as our actually all Baha'is, that in her possession was the most priceless gem the world had ever seen, the message of Baha'u'llah. She believed that in showing this gem and offering it to anyone, king or peasant, she was conferring the greatest bounty upon him he could ever receive. It was this proud conviction that enabled her, a woman of no wealth or social prestige, plain, doubtedly dressed and neither a great scholar nor an outstanding intellectual to meet more kings, queens, princes and princesses, presidents and men of distinction, fame and prominence and tell them about the Baha'i faith than any other Baha'i in the history of this cause has ever done. And again, Shoghi Effendi used to remark that out of his suffering, something always seemed to be born. 
he would go through these ordeals by fire, for indeed he seemed to fairly burn with suffering, and then some rain from heaven in the form of good news would shower upon him and help to revive him. He had this great suffering primarily because of the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran and in other places. This was the good news. Next, Bucharest. The American minister said I could not see the Queen Marie of Romania, but I wrote her a letter and sent her Abdul Baha's picture and Dr. Esselmont's book, which is known as Baha'u'llah in the New Era. This was a letter Martha Root sent to her friend, Ella Goodall Cooper, on the 19th of February, 1926. This was what Marie looked like, Queen Marie, in 1926. And so began her study of the Baha'i faith. She records in her diary, Sunday, February 21st, 1926. She was at Kotro Chen Palace. Went to English church with Ileana, but it was what I would call a poor service. I really pray better at home with my Baha'u'llah books and teaching, which have brought me such a message lately. The message, in fact, that I have always been waiting for. It has become a joy and comfort to me and has at last brought God quite near. For the first time, I have felt religion. Every principle of Baha'u'llah is acceptable to me, understandable, of greatest and perfect help. All my hazy desires and thoughts have been suddenly made concrete by this teaching. My whole soul answers, it feels it to be the teaching. I am also giving it to Ileana, for she too is a great searcher and astonishingly open and waiting for truth. Then on that same day, she writes to her friend, Loie Fuller, lately a great hope has come to me from one Abdul Baha. I have found in his and his father, Baha'u'llah's message of faith, all my yearning for real religion satisfied. If you ever hear of Baha'is or of the Baha'i movement, which is known in America, you will know what that is, what I mean. These books have strengthened me beyond belief, and I am now ready to die any day full of hope. But I pray God not to take me away yet, for I still have a lot of work to do. This was a page from the first letter that Marie addressed to Shoghi Effendi, guardian of the Baha'i faith, in which is this phrase, with bowed head, part, portion of this phrase, with bowed head I recognize that I too am but an instrument in greater hands and rejoice in the knowledge. And the, as I mentioned at the beginning, my second book is called An Instrument in Greater Hands. Um, Martha Root wrote to Shoghi Effendi to tell him that she had met the queen and he wrote back saying, I am thrilled by your account. And he extended an invitation to the queen to visit the holy shrines in the Holy Land. Um, and uh, Queen Marie was traveling with her daughter, Ileana, to the Middle East. And Shoghi Effendi writes, family of Abdul Baha, join me in renewing the expression of our loving and heartfelt invitation to your gracious majesty and Her Royal Highness Princess Ileana to visit his home in Haifa. Your Majesty's acceptance to visit Baha'u'llah's shrine and prison city of Akka will, apart from its historic significance, be a source of immeasurable strength, joy, and hope to the silent sufferers of the faith throughout the East. Our fondest love, prayers, and best wishes for Your Majesty's happiness. 
and welfare. And it's very clear that they intended to accept this invitation. Unfortunately, they were prevented by both the Romanian and British governments from doing this. The telegram that was eventually sent to Shoghi Effendi on the 28th of March, 1930 by the Romanian minister in Cairo, Philip Lahovari, was contained an untruth. He said, Her Majesty regrets that not passing through Palestine, she will not be able to visit you. But her ship did, in fact, sail into Haifa port, and she was whisked out of the country into Transjordan, which is currently the country of Jordan. And she then visited Egypt. Uh, Ileana eventually visited Jerusalem as well, and returned to Haifa. And there's an interesting story. I, I'm not going into it. If you're interested, you can find it in my book that is detailing this travel. Here's a photograph of the queen and her daughter from a, an Egyptian newspaper and a photograph visiting the Sphinx. And uh, a story that is very interesting is that of Lillian Baron McNeil, who was a childhood friend of Queen Marie and her sisters. They met in Malta and Lillian and her husband Mar uh, moved to uh, Palestine. Her husband was stationed there by the British government uh, during the mandate. And uh, Lillian had become a Baha'i and she knew Shoghi Effendi. And they loved Palestine so much that she and her husband decided that they would settle in Palestine after he retired from the army. And they went around the countryside looking for a suitable home and they came across what they thought was a beautiful place. And it turns out that this home was the first house that Baha'u'llah was allowed to live in after he left the actual prison city of Akka. And Lillian and her husband did not know that. So they learned about this. And then Lillian tells Queen Marie about where she's living. Marie writes to Lillian, dear little Lillian, it was indeed nice to hear from you and to think that you are of all things living in Haifa and are like I am a follower of the Baha'i teachings. And we had planned Ileana, my youngest daughter and I to visit the Holy Grave. Shoghi Effendi was expecting me. Then there were political intrigues. It was after the death of my husband and people were being nasty with me. And I had under pressure to give it up. And it was a great sorrow to me for more reasons than one. Yes, certainly it interests me that you are living in that special house. The teachers love, so loved flowers and being English, I can imagine what a lovely garden you have made in that Eastern climate with much love, Marie. Please give Shoghi Effendi a warm greeting from me. This is an appreciation that Queen Marie wrote and sent to Shoghi Effendi. And it says the Baha'i teaching brings peace and understanding. It is like a warm, wide embrace gathering together all those who have long searched for words of hope. It accepts all great prophets gone before. It destroys no other creeds and leaves all doors open. Saddened by the continual strife amongst believers of many confessions. And um, 
wearied of their intolerance towards each other. I discovered in the Baha'i teaching the real spirit of Christ so often denied and misunderstood. Unity instead of strife, hope instead of un uh, condemnation, love instead of hate, and a great reassurance for all men. A message that is as suitable today as it was when she wrote it. And another in 1934, the Baha'i teaching brings peace to the soul and hope to the heart. To those in search of assurance, the words of the Father are as a fountain in the desert after long wandering. This is one of the last photographs of Queen Marie before her untimely death. And this was the last photograph here is her family at her funeral and this is the place where she's buried in Kurta de Arjesh next to her husband and the Universal House of Justice, which is currently the um, administrative, international administrative uh, body that conducts the affairs of the faith around the world, is has its seat on Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. This is the passageway that leads to the council chamber of this body. And here is a portrait of Queen Marie. And at the far end, you see a painting of Abdul Baha. And I'd like to finish with Queen Marie's last message. In 1936, more than ever today, when the world is facing such a crisis of bewilderment and unrest, must we stand firm in faith, seeking that which binds together instead of tearing asunder. To those searching for light, the Baha'i teachings offer a star which will lead them to deeper understanding, to assurance, peace, and goodwill with all men. Thank you very much. So I, I think I speak for all of us that that was really moving and wonderful, seeing seeing so many beautiful pictures of her and reading her words. And uh, I, I think I'm going to go now and pick up the book off the shelf and start again. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs>